designing modern board games. And today, Lecture 24b. More on the play of Stalingrad, based on George Philly's book, Stalingrad for Beginners, now available on Smashwords.com and Amazon Kindle. To see the full game and all of its graphics, note the Stalingrad modules at Zunsu.com and VassalEngine.org. Much more on the game can be found at BoardGameGeek.com. For a copy of the map and unit counters, as redone with superior artwork, go to CamelotGameStore.com. To buy the original game, which alas is out of print, seek out finer used board game dealers all across the world. This lecture continues my discussion of how a hex encounter board war game is played. The point of the discussion in the lecture is that many students will have played light war games like Risk. They will have played computer games with military components, many of them. Uh, they will have played perhaps classic games, but few students are familiar with, in any detail, hex encounter board war games. So what we're do going to do is to go in some detail over the play of a representative game so that if people want to explore the field, they have at least the door open a crack. The particular game I'm discussing is the classic Avalon Hill board war game, Stalingrad, which was the most analyzed board war game in the history of the hobby. I have now reached the point where I'm going to discuss effects of terrain on combat, and I start with rivers. Here we see two maps of terrain with rivers. On the left, we have a straight line river, and the end of the river square on T30 points to the square S31. We have another river here, and the end of the river square at U30 points at the square T30. In the figure on the right, we have rivers with a river branch on V32. That is, we have two rivers coming together and a third going out. There are also railroad tracks in the vicinity, but railroads have no effect on combat. The basic issue in the effect of rivers on combat is that if the attacking units are on river squares and the defender is sitting behind the river and absolutely every attacker is on a river square and the defender is not on a river square, then the defender's defense factors are doubled in computing the combat odds. If the attacker is on one river and the defender is on a completely different river, the completely different river has no effect on combat. Uh, river end squares have a specific feature, namely here is on T30 is a river end square. The river comes to a stop. If we were to trace the river all the way downstream, it would probably go into some body of water. That's not a river end square. The body of water counts as part of the river. The river here on T30, the river end points on S31, and therefore the S square S31 is not behind the river with respect to T30. In contrast, S32, I'm sorry, T31 and U30 are both behind the river. So I'm showing you first the terrain with no unit counters on it. Now we will skip ahead and look at the terrain with German and Russian units in place. Here we now see several sets of German and Russian counters placed on the river squares you just looked at. So there are three German units here, and there are one, two, three Russian units here. There are two German units, one, two, seen here, and they are facing two Russian units. Sometimes in discussing this figure, I will say there are additional German units hiding off the map over here someplace. So what is the situation with respect to these two sets of unit counters? Let's start with the figure 
on the left. Suppose that it is the Russian turn. The Russians would th then have three units adjacent to the three German units here. Each of the Russian units is required to attack. Each of the ger three German units is required to defend in some battle. A simple outcome is that each of the three Russian units attacks one of the three German units. How is this to be evaluated? The 65th Russian is on a clear terrain square. It's attacking a German unit on the river. A defender on the river does not get a benefit from being next to an attacker off the river. We also have a Russian unit here on the river, but it's attacking a German unit on an adjacent square of the same river. The word adjacent matters in one case on the map board. And therefore, since we are attacking, the Russian unit is attacking parallel to the river, the German unit gets no benefit. Finally, we have a Russian unit here on a river end square. It's attacking a German unit that is not on a river square of the same river. It's on a river square of a different river. The outcome depends on where this river end points. If the river end had pointed up here on square T31, then the German unit would not be on the square that the river end pointed at, and the German unit would be doubled on defense with respect to the Russian attack. So this would be, if it's the top German unit, a 4 to 8 doubled is 16, a 1 to 4. On the other hand, if the G Russian noticed that this German unit was doubled, the Russian could say, I will have this unit and this unit, these two Russian units, attack two German units. And the two German units are on a river square, that has no effect. Uh, this Russian unit is on a river square. However, the other unit in the attack, this unit, the 65th, is an undoubling unit because it is on a clear terrain square. And therefore, the attack is being made at 4 plus 4 or 8 to whatever the defense factor of the two Germans are. The German units are not doubled on defense, even though one of the Russian units is on a river square, because the other Russian unit is not on a river square. However, you may notice, if you look back at the previous bit of video, that this river square on U30 actually points at the German units. Therefore, the Russian units are on a river end square and are attacking a square at which the river end points, and therefore the Russian units will observe that the German is not doubled on defense. Let's turn that around. Suppose the three German units are attacking the three Russian units. This is a German unit attacking a Russian unit that is on a square, a square at which the river end square, this river end square, points. The German is on the river end square, the Russian is on the square at which the river end points, and therefore the Russian is not doubled on defense, and this would be an 8 to 6 or 1 to 1. The 886 underneath here is attacking a 464 here. The attack is proceeding along a river. Well, the Russian unit is on a river square, and the German is on a river square. They're on adjacent squares of the same river, so the river has no effect, and we have here another 8 to 6 or 1 to 1. Finally, the last German unit here is attacking this Russian unit. The Russian unit here uh, notices the German is on a river end square. The river is end square does not point at U30. It points over here at S31. And therefore, the German is attacking from a river end square to some other square, not the square at which the river end points. And the Russian is doubled, so this would be an 8 to 6 times 2 or 12, 8 to 12 or 1 to 2. The fact that the Russian is on a river end square itself 
a river n square of a different river has no effect on the discussion. Let's proceed over here to the figure on the right. There are several different ways this could be interpreted. Suppose the Germans are attacking. We could say this German unit is attacking this Russian unit, and the other German unit is attacking the other Russian unit. We can't fight this in one big battle, because the German 14th armor down here is not adjacent to the Russian 42nd infantry up here. They're not in each other's zone of control, so a battle involving the 14th armor cannot also involve the Russian 42 infantry. So one simple case is that each unit is attacking due towards the top of the board. The German is attacking along the river, so this attack is an 8 to 6 or 1 to 1. This German is on a river square. The Russian is behind the river on a non-river square, so the Russian is doubled on defense, and this is an 8 to 6 times 2, 8 to 12 or 1 to 2. If, however, the, there had been another German unit, you can't see it, on the upper right hand corner of the map also attacking the Russian. In that case there would be a German 8 and a German anything at all attacking a Russian 464. However the German unit up here would function as an undoubling unit namely the German unit up here would be attacking from a clear terrain square and the Russian unit would not be doubled against this German 886. So this would be 8 plus something to 6 as the combat. Let's turn that around. Suppose the Russians are attacking in the uh, and therefore attacking in the other direction. What is the situation? Well, this Russian unit, the 42nd Infantry, could be attacking the 41st Armor the armor is on a river square, the attacker is on a clear terrain square, so there's no terrain effect on combat. This would be a 4 to 8 or 1 to 2. What about this Russian unit? Th this Russian unit is on an intersection of two rivers. So this Russian unit, if it attacks this German unit, is on a river square of the same river, namely the river that flows along the map through V31 into V32, but it's also on the river square of a different river, namely the river that starts at the top of the figure and flows down and heads off towards the right side of the figure. And therefore, from the perspective of this Russian unit, this German unit is doubled. There is a straightforward way to see if there's a doubt that the German unit is doubled on defense. Ditto if this Russian were attacking this German and other Russia, the other Russian and other German were in other battles somehow. This German would be doubled. How can you see that? The simple rule is that adding a river to the map does not undouble the defender. So if the Russian here were attacking the German here, the 27th is attacking the 14th, and the only river on the map flows from Tula to the 27th Infantry over to the 41st Armor. Well, clearly this Russian is on a river square, the German is on a non-river square, and the German is doubled. Adding this river branch, the one through V31, does not undouble the German. The German would be doubled if the river branch were not there, so it's still doubled when the river is added. Similarly, this German, well, the, suppose the river branch that goes under the 41st Infantry were not there. In case that case, this Russian would be attacking that German, this Russian would be attacking the German over here, some other Russian would be attacking the German down here. Let's just focus on this Russian attacking this German. If the river branch that flows off the right edge of the, the map were not there, then clearly this Russian would be on a river square, the German would be on a clear terrain square, 
the R- Russian w- would find that the German is doubled on defense, and this would be 4 to 16 or 1 to 4. Adding the river branch that goes under the 41st does not undouble the German armor. The German is still undoubled if the 27th inf- Russian 27th and nothing else attacks it. On the other hand, if there were a Russian over here to attack the 14th armor, and these two Russian units were attacking the 41st, well, yes, this Russian unit is on a river square, so you'd think the German might be doubled, but the 42nd Russian inf- Tree Corps would function as an undoubling unit. It's attacking from clear terrain against the German. The German would be undoubled on defense. Let us briefly consider how snow affects movement and combat. We have two Russians sitting here, the 27th and the 42nd, behind the Sphere River. The Sphere River, however, is one of the four Russian rivers that freezes in winter. <clears throat> if we were in summer, the, Rus- the best this German infant- r- armored corps could do would be to move to K-36 or J-37. It would enter a swamp square. It would have to stop. This German armor could move on to the railroad or follow the railroad and end up on this square and then attack the two Russians. But the two Russians would be behind a river line. They'd be 6 plus 6 is 12 times 2 is 24. The attack would be at 8 to 24 is 1 to 3. There'd no, be no chance for a German victory. Suppose, however, we go to snow. In snow, the swamps, we are well north, the swamp, these swamps, not the Pripyat marshes, but these swamps, freeze, and this German unit, which would now have a movement factor of three, could go one, two, three, or if it wanted, one, two, three, and it would be attacking the two Russians. On one hand, the sphere is frozen, so the Russians are not doubled. On the other hand, since the Lake Ladoga down here is frozen, this, and the swamp is frozen, this German can now go one, two, three. In summer, the German could not move on I-34, but in snow it could. We now have a German unit here, and a German unit here, or more amusingly, a German unit up on I-36. The Germans have 16 attack factors, the Russians have 12 defense factors, the German attack is proceeding at 16 to 12 or 1 to 1. And guess what? The German units are on opposite sides of the Russian units, if the German moves to I-36. That is a 1 to 1, and the defender has no retreat. The defender can't move through the two German units, and it cannot move through 1, 2, 3, 4, any of the squares in the German unit zone of control. So therefore, it's a one-to-one, and half the time the Russian units will be wiped out. This move would be a little risky if we were on the last month of winter, because the Germans move, the Russians perhaps survive the experience, and perhaps not. And then it's the first turn of spring, the Germans roll the dice to see if Lake Ladoga melts. If Lake Ladoga melts, The 41st armor is sitting here on the lake. The lake melts and the tanks fall through the ice and are lost along with everything else in the unit. In principle, there are occasional times when you take risks like this because you mission critical have to do this in order to win the game. However, he who lives by the one-to-one will surely perish by the one-to-one probably rather quickly. We now turn to the effect of mountains and cities on combat. Veteran players will realize that if the Russian army is in the indicated position making an attack on Germans, uh, the German position is probably not the world's most favorable. Nonetheless, let's consider the situation. Suppose the Russian units are the attackers. This German unit, it's really a Romanian, is on clear terrain. It's not doubled. This Romanian unit is in a city. It's doubled on defense. 
This Romanian unit is on a mountain square. It's doubled on defense. So the three Russian German units put together have two plus four because it's doubled, plus four because it's doubled, or ten defense factors, and the Germans have whatever is in this stack on the attack. The fact that the Germans are in a mountain square has no effect on this unit or this unit or this unit being doubled. If the attack were proceeding the other way, which I do not recommend, uh, the German units are on a mountain square, and therefore the German units are on doubled on defense. The fact that the Romanian here is in a mountain has no effect on that. So the visible German would be a 10 times 2 or 20 on defense. There are more units down there. And the Germans would be attacking at extremely unfavorable odds. We now advance to discuss the supply rules. There is a traditional statement that amateurs discuss tactics and serious military people discuss logistics. As Napoleon said, an army marches on its belly. Stalingrad has no fewer than four supply, isolation, and related rules. First, the Germans and the Russians each have supply points. For the Russians, the supply point is the east edge of the map, and the east edge of the map in this figure is right at the top. For the Germans, the supply points are the cities of Helsinki, Bucharest, and Warsaw. In order to be in the supply, a unit must be able to trace a path from itself to one of its supply points. The path cannot go off the edge of the board. It cannot go through unfrozen lakes or ocean. It cannot go through enemy zones of control. It cannot go through enemy units. <coughs> It cannot go through neutral Turkey. Uh, the rules actually say it can't. the supply line can't go through Sweden, but it's not clear how a supply line could reach Sweden, so I've never worried about that one. So here we have a case we can look at it, which we have Russian and German units that have gotten into very close contact, and we ask how, what their supply situation is. Uh, first... The Russian unit up at the top of the map, the 36th Infantry, is right against the east edge. It is always in the supply because it has no supply line to block. The fact that there could be a German unit right next to it, and therefore a zone of control in the square that the unit occupies does not matter. The zone of control has to block the path. Let's consider the other Russian units. The Russian unit here, the 6th, that has a supply line, the blue line, which goes through an unblocked square to the east edge of the board. The Russian unit here is in trouble, though. The Russian unit here, well, <clears throat> every path away from this unit either runs into a German zone of control, G. That would be, for example, this German, the green, any of the green stars or the yellow stars, well it's only this yellow star, or this German unit. And therefore all of the supply paths to this Russian unit are blocked. This Russian unit, the 12th, has a supply path that goes one square. There are no German zones of control here. However, the next two squares of the path orange are blocked by R German zones of control. So the German u Russian units here and here are isolated, they're out of supply. Ditto, the Germ Russian unit here, is surrounded on all sides, green stars, by German zones of control. And therefore, this unit is isolated. The astute re reader will note that the German 8th Infantry here has exactly the same problem, namely this square, 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 all of the surrounding squares are in German zones of control or occupied by German units, or both. And therefore, this German unit is also isolated. The rule in Stalingrad is that if a unit is isolated, it has two complete turns to restore its supply path. 
If it fails to do so, it can do so, it need, only has to do so momentarily. If it fails to do so, it starves and is removed from the map and goes to the dead pile. So if we suppose that these Russian units were isolated on a German turn, two complete turns later, that is the start of the second German turn after isolation occurred, the Russian units would be removed from the board. Ditto, this German unit has two complete turns, so if, it's ice, if this unit were isolated in January 1942 in the Russian turn, on the Russian March 1942 turn, the German would, two complete turns later, if there is no zone return to supply, if the German is still isolated, the German is removed from the map. That's unit isolation. Note that a German unit stacked in a supply city has no supply path to be blocked and therefore can never be isolated. We now reach replacements, reinforcements, and supply point isolation. Reinforcements are new units that were never on the map before. The only reinforcements in the game are small Hungarian and Italian forces totaling six 334s and 336s that come onto the map in 1942. They're brought on into the map not in Finland, not on top of a Russian unit, not in a Russian zone of control, and they then are moved freely. There are also replacements. Replacements give us the path whereby which units are taken out of the dead pile and restored to play. Each side has a replacement rate. For the Germans, the replacement rate is four defense factors per turn starting with the second turn. For the Russians, there is a replacement rate separately for each of their, their three cities, Leningrad, Moscow, and Stalingrad, the three cities the German is trying to capture. Uh, the replacement rate is four factors per turn, defense factors, starting in September 41, raising to five in December 41, and then to six per city in April 1942. So the Russians start out with 12 defense factors a turn, but only in, on turn 4, and this later goes up to 15 or 18. Replacement factors may be accumulated until they are used. Uh, some players advocated for a strategy of saving up a rather large number of replacement factors. This is particularly true for the German. And so they would save up 20 or 30 or 40 replacement factors and use them to bring on to the map all at once uh, 40 defense factors of units. Uh, other German players disagree with this tactic. The Russians may use the defense factors to bring on replacements in any of the three replacement cities. The replacement factors are accumulated, so on the September they have 12. If they don't use them on, in October, they'd have 24. Suppose they have 24 defense factors saved up in October, saved up or arrived. Then in October they could bring into the map a 236 like this one and two 7104s, a total of 23 defense factors. They'd then have one defense factor that they had not yet spent, which would be accumulated, saved until it was spent. <coughs> However, there are some complications because the Russian cities are not supply points and have supply issues. The first issue is that if a Russian supply city is surrounded by German zones of control, those are the green stars here, lakes, those are the yellow stars here, ocean, that's the orange star, the edge of the board, that can certainly happen if it's the north or south or west edge, then there is no supply into the city. 
and after the city has been isolated for two turns, just like a German or unit has, Russian unit has been isolated for two turns, the Russian city surrenders. And when it surrenders, it takes with it all of the Russian units that were inside the line of isolation, these colored stars. In particular, it takes with it any Russian units that were inside the line of isolation for fewer than two turns. This sounds as though there would be some very cute exploits for the German player, but these are very hard to arrange. I've really never seen them done. For Russian replacement cities, however, there is a stronger form of being surrounded. Suppose a, a Russian replacement city, such as the one seen here, is surrounded by a line of zones of control. And that's only zones of control. Lakes don't count, seas don't count, edge of the board doesn't count, only zones of control count. Uh, fortunately for the Germans, zones of control are always the six surrounding squares, so J32 and K32 are in the zone of control of a German unit. Uh, readers will note historically that the Germans deployed motor torpedo boats on Lake Latoga in an effort to shut down Russian supply lines. So the city is surrounded by zones of control. Once this occurs, the city stops contributing replacement factors to the Russian total. So if this is September 1941 and the German units are as indicated, and nothing unfortunate has happened anywhere else, the Russians would get four replacement factors for Stalingrad, four replacement factors for Lenin, for Moscow, and zero replacement factors because the city is surrounded for Leningrad. They could, however, still bring replacements onto the map in Leningrad, but, they, but Leningrad is not contributing its own replacement factors to the total. Note, by the way, for both sides, when you bring on replacements, the stacking rule only applies at the end of the movement phase and the end of the battle phase, and therefore if the Russians had a hundred accumulated replacements and chose to do so, they could use some reasonable number of them to bring on a huge pile of units inside Leningrad, a huge pile limited only by the fact that, they're, they, that they could only actually bring in 12 units because that's all the space they have. Now we come to the last state of affairs, namely here we have Leningrad under attack. It's a replacement city, but at the start of the Russian turn, there is a German unit, it's actually Finn in this case, parked adjacent to the replacement city. In that case, A, uh, the replacement city will generate no replacement factors because there's a unit next to it and B the Russian cannot bring replacements onto the map in Leningrad she has to bring them onto the map in Moscow or Stalingrad. The first thing that happens at the start of the game is that the Russian chooses where to put her units. This is different than chess in which there is a fixed opening position. Instead, we have a fixed a set of positions that the Russian gets to choose. The Russian, however, has some constraints. The Russian units can only be brought into the board on the Russian side of the Soviet Axis border. Here is the Soviet Axis border and the Russian has to begin on her side of the border. So here, is, here are units on her side of the border facing Finland. Ditto, here are Russian units on the central front, and the Russian units have been placed where the Russian player chooses to put them. Observe that the Russian player can place units right up to the border, for example, here, and here, and here, and here. The Russian has placed units adjacent to the border. The Russian is allowed to do that. The German is not so well off. The German units have to start the game one square back from the border and then move up to attack the Ger Russians. Here are more Russians in a starting positions. Here the Russian has chosen to start all of her units at least one square back from the border. 
the border is the black dashed line. The Russian units are parked behind the Prut River, behind the river here. The German, the Russians did not have to do that. The Russians could have started their units on the Prut River. The Russians could have started units on the square here. The Russian chose not to do so. The German has to start one square back from the border. So the German could not start units on KK-12. He could start units on LL-12. There is no rule requiring units to start near the border. Uh, if the Russian wants to deploy her entire army in a tight ring of defenses around the city of Stalingrad, which is way on the far side of the map, she is entitled to do so. Um, perhaps the, the theory is the German will look at this and die of surprise because the, starting the Russian units way back there is probably not the best possible move. Here is a German move at the start of the game. The Germans must start off one square back from the border as you see here. The Germans are and the under a few constraints. The Finnish units must start in Finland. The Germans can start additional units, but no more than eight combat factors in Finland. The eight combat factors can be German units, they can be Romanian units, the Hungarians and Italians aren't in play yet. Here we see the Germans have stacked up, and they have put into Finland a 554 and a 336, two extra German units in Finland. So they have reinforced the Finns a bit. The usual tradition in play is the, that the German player shows where the Russian units will be attacked, that is, where the German units will move, as opposed to setting up and then trying to move into combat. And therefore, we see, as the Germans start, the Germans have units as indicated here and here. Those German units had to start off back at, for example, Konigsberg and then move across the border. If the Russian thinks the German has done something impossible, this is more common in Romania, she is entitled to insist that the Ru Germans indicate the true starting positions one square back from the border and then show the moves. Here are more German moves. The Germans have moved units up onto the river here. They have moved units into the mountains. The German units here and here had to start one square back from the border. They are shuffling through mountains, so the maximum distance they could move is one square as indicated. The Germans had to start one square back from the border, and that has consequences. They start here. They move here next to the border. They could have moved to the square labeled with the letter A, but chose not to. Uh, however, that's as far as they could go, because when they reach the letter A or they reach CC14, they would have moved into a Russian zone of control, and they would have had to start. In contrast, if the Germans were allowed to start next to the border, for example, on the square labeled A, on this turn they could have moved one square onto DD14 and joined in an attack on the Russian units. Now you might ask, why would the Germans not occupy square A? Well, as things stand, the six German units here are all attacking across a river, so the Russian is doubled. On the other hand, this is 24 plus 18, or 42 German attack factors against six Russian defense factors, is a 7 to 1. The Russian unit for sure dies, even though it's doubled. And because the Russian unit is doubled, the German units, in particular these 3886s, are entitled to advance across the river and occupy square EE12. Once they have occupied EE12, uh, gee, the Russians cannot set out delaying units on EE13 or FF12, because if they did, they would have to attack this very powerful Russian stack. Here we have Germans facing the Russian forces defending the Prut River. The Germans have set up units facing Hungary. They can't enter Hungary this turn, 
but they could enter Hungary next turn, and so they could move into Hungary, board the railroad here, take the railroad to II-11, and then debark into the mountains II-12 and HH-12. The Germans had another option of some interest, namely the Germans could have started units, say, in Bucharest. The, these units could then have taken the railroad as far as KK-13, then moved one square normal move to here, one square parallel to the railroad into the mountains to the location of the 3R, and at this point the Germans have never moved across a hex edge between mountain squares, and therefore could move on this turn onto the square II-12. Observe that the Germans have some constraints. In particular, if the Russian had started a unit on NN-13, that's certainly a legal move, there, there would have been Russian zones of control blocking this railroad, and the only way units, German units could have moved here is to have started on LL-12 and MM-12. There's a stacking limit. The Germans could have started three units on LL-12, three units on MM-12, and therefore if this there was a zone of control blocking the railroad. In this whole area, the Germans could have a maximum of six units. So that is the position of the German army in the south. And you notice the Germans have taken their first move as their opening move. However, it is possible to defend the claim that the German units you see here could all have reached their positions. And the Germans have to be prepared to do that. We have now finished discussing how Stalingrad is played. If you want to learn more about the play of Stalingrad, you can take the book Stalingrad for Beginners and work through the game that I games that I show you set up. There are also some tactical rules and cute tactics discussed in Stalingrad for Beginners. A slightly more advanced book is the book Stalingrad Replayed, which is primarily a demonstration, lots of figures, not tons of words, of several games played between players at different skill levels. I should emphasize the point of these two books is to take readers, many of whom will be just like you, the listener, who have never played any hex encounter board game, and introduce you to the board game and how it's played so you have some idea of what to do and maybe some idea of what not to do. Assuredly, there are grandmaster players who wish I would divulge all of my secrets, if I only had any, uh, but... I am not writing for grandmasters, I am writing for beginning players to activate the play of the game and bring new people into the hobby. And that's it for the lectures on how you play Stalingrad and Hex Encounter board war games.